Elena Veselinov was born in Bulgaria and completed both bachelor's and master's degrees in sociology at Sofia University before moving to England where she added a second master's degree in human rights from Essex University in 1992. She completed her PhD in sociology at the State University of New York at Albany and then spent five years at the University of South Carolina, arriving just after I left USC for Florida State University. She published this article on gated communities in 2008, the same year she left South Carolina for Queens College and the City University of New York, where she teaches today. This article considers attempts to restrict access to neighborhoods in American cities. It is important because Veselinov shows us that the popular image of the gated community as a very visible example of segregation by social class was never a very valid generalization and that it is becoming less so with each passing year. The actual profiles of gated communities and the factors that lead to more or less of them in contemporary cities is a much more complicated but very revealing picture. When we are on the subject of segregation by social class, it makes sense to stop and consider one of the most visible forms of residential separation, the gated community. In fact, most people probably think of gated communities as the ultimate expression of exclusion, places where the so-called lifeboat ethic of cutting yourself off from all the problems and liabilities of the rest of the world finds its fullest expression. Elena Veselinov wrote this article to present some of her own research findings about the social realities of these places. There are many varieties of neighborhoods in U.S. cities, so her first order of business is to specify clearly what counts in her study as a gated community. She explains that the only places she will count are residential neighborhoods, not any kind of industrial or commercial areas that might also have gates and restricted access. The community part of the term implies that we're talking about people's homes, not their workplaces or where they shop. Second, she is talking about residential neighborhoods that are completely enclosed by some type of physical barrier to entry. You may have encountered a neighborhood with only the entrance closed off by a gate, but to qualify for Veselinov's definition, some kind of wall, high fence, or other barrier must extend all around the entire perimeter of the neighborhood, blocking off pedestrian access as well as restricting traffic. You might also have seen neighborhoods with ornate entrances that look a little like gates, with at least short sections of brick wall on either side of the street, but there's no actual barrier to traffic. These imitation gated entrances are only ornaments and do not qualify the location as a gated community. Gates can be operated by flesh and blood people working as sentries or controlled by electronic codes or other automated procedures but they must be working gates that can actually prevent access to the neighborhood when they are closed. Gated communities not only have barriers to entry for both vehicles and pedestrians, but also typically restrict access to public spaces inside the community, as well as the private space of people's individual homes. Sometimes the open spaces inside such neighborhoods are not actually public at all. For example, when the streets are privately owned and maintained, or common areas such as parks or swimming pools are owned in condominium by the residents rather than being public spaces that belong to the city or some other public jurisdiction. Not only does the boundary wall or other barrier block access to the neighborhood, but all of the space inside that boundary often is regarded as private or controlled space rather than public space. Neighborhood residents or their agents may challenge the right of any non-resident to use such controlled spaces, sometimes including even sidewalks. Finally, Veselinov recognizes that gated communities often impose special internal rules and restrictions on their residents. This is not strictly an element that defines a gated community, since such homeowners association rules or other covenants and restrictions placed in deeds when property is sold also appear in other non-gated neighborhoods. The gated neighborhood, however, is a particularly likely place to adopt such internal rules since they are needed for regulating the access process itself. It is then easy to add other rules to the list, such as relatively trivial ones about trash cans, mailboxes, house colors, and similar concerns, or more serious ones, such as the now illegal covenants 
that once placed racial and other restrictions on future disposition of property. While racial covenants have been ruled illegal, other kinds of covenants are still very much a part of the internal rules that some neighborhoods impose on themselves. Residents may have to agree to various conditions of condominium, such as mandatory participation in contracted lawn care services for the entire neighborhood, or mandatory fees to maintain common areas that are actually privately owned space, sometimes including even the streets in the neighborhood or the water and sewer mains beneath them. Why have gated neighborhoods proliferated in American cities in the last few decades? Veselinov reviews several of the most common justifications that people generally offer when they are asked why they move to a gated community. The first and most obvious response stresses the security of both persons and property perceived as a result of the gates and walls around the neighborhood. People also sometimes justify living in gated communities because they perceive a stronger sense of community with their neighbors. It is not clear why the gate at the entrance should make for a stronger sense of community than in a similar neighborhood without a gate, but people often do give this response. Another frequent justification concerns property values. Residents of gated communities often respond that the resale value of their homes increase faster inside the gated community than do homes in other neighborhoods of the city. They sometimes add by way of explanation that this faster increase is the result of a growing demand for the security that a gated community can provide so that people are increasingly willing to pay for this feature. However, it is important to point out, as Veselinov does here, that a fairly large body of research has been looking at the validity of all these claims for many years now. There's very mixed evidence on every one of these points. It is not at all clear that property values increase faster inside gated communities than in other communities without gates. We are careful to compare neighborhoods with houses that all start out with similar ages, sizes, and starting values no particular advantage of gates and walls for rates of appreciation has been demonstrated consistently in this research. Crime statistics also do not show consistently lower rates of burglary, homicide, or other crimes in gated neighborhoods when compared with ungated areas of similar social and economic background. And sociometric studies of friendship networks also find no consistent difference between residents of gated communities and otherwise similar neighborhoods without gates or walls. So what then, asks Veselinov, is all this gating and wall building actually about? Her conclusion is that the gates and walls are really mostly about distrust and fear, fear of strangers, fear of social change, and of loss of personal security and status in a complex and competitive society. Having spelled out exactly what she includes in her category of gated communities, she then sets out to compare this kind of residential sorting and exclusion to the more general pattern of residential segregation in U.S. cities. After all, it is not necessary to build gates and walls in order to sort out and segregate our cities. We have managed to sort ourselves out into neighborhoods heavily segregated by both race and social class without any kind of physical barriers at all in most cases. But Veselinov would like to find out whether cities that are more segregated in the more conventional sense also tend to have more gated communities, also sealing themselves off from each other in this newer fashion. It's at the entrances to some of the most exclusive private mansions and estates for centuries. The idea of walls and gates around an entire neighborhood is a relatively recent idea for contemporary U.S. cities. The first examples of the trend appeared as walls and gates for newly built special purpose retirement communities all across the Sun Belt, from Florida and Texas to Arizona and California. The first of these self-contained communities was Del Webb's Sun City, established near Phoenix, Arizona in 1960. As Veselinov explains in her article, the resulting trend to more gated communities really took off during the 1970s as more and more developers copied the idea. The focus on retirement communities guaranteed that the people choosing to live inside those first walls were indeed segregating themselves, not only along lines of both race and social class simultaneously, but also adding a third dimension, segregation by age and stage of the life cycle. 
But from the outset, life in these huge walled suburbs dreamed up by developer entrepreneurs was not really a scaled up version of secluded estates for the wealthy, as the advertising brochure sometimes implied. This stereotype of gated communities as enclaves of ultimate wealth and privilege may actually fit a few neighborhoods in U.S. cities today. But Veselinov cites statistics showing that for every such upper-class gated community, there's another middle-class gated neighborhood somewhere, and even gated working-class areas. Even if the earliest gated retirement communities catered pretty much only to people who could afford to pay the prices charged by Dell Webb and the other developers, as the pattern spread across the country, it also spread across lines of social class. These gates and walls became yet another example of social imitation, copying an outward form in an attempt to achieve the status associated with it. We have to remember, though, that although gated communities now have spread to communities of people from a wide range of social classes, this wide range of social classes is not represented within particular neighborhoods in most cases. In part, this is just a byproduct of the fact that many of these gated communities are unified developments. Not only the gates and the walls, but most or all of the homes inside them are all constructed at the same time, often by the same developer and for the same target market, sometimes retirees, as with Sun City and other retirement communities, sometimes young urban professionals, in the case of some gated in-town condominium complexes, or sometimes middle-class families with children. When an entire neighborhood is constructed from scratch, it is not surprising to find it filling up with a pretty homogenous group of people in terms of social class and perhaps also ethnicity and even stage of the life cycle. This kind of incidental segregation, due to the uniformity of the newly constructed housing stock itself, is just as true of many new neighborhoods that are constructed without any gates or walls. Another even more recent trend in gated communities does not have even an incidental effect of sorting out people due to uniform new construction. In some cases reported by Veselinov, people living in older existing neighborhoods have gotten the idea that reasons mentioned above, given by people to explain why they move to gated communities, are completely true. Once this idea takes root that gated communities really are safer, or that they improve property values, people in existing neighborhoods have been known to hire contractors to come and build new walls and gates around their older existing neighborhoods to make them more attractive to potential new residents. As we often find with social perceptions, it doesn't really matter whether these ideas are true or not. If people believe them, they will have real behavioral consequences, just the way that belief in witches or ideas about racial superiority can have real consequences. And of course, it would not be surprising to find contractors and developers encouraging such beliefs in order to stimulate new contracts for building gates and walls. But building a wall around an existing neighborhood is not likely to have much effect on the degree of segregation by class or ethnicity that is already present there. So Veselinov has at least one reason to think that the proliferation of gated communities may not always be linked to more conventional forms of segregation. In some cases, though, the gates and barriers clearly are created in order to strengthen or maintain existing residential segregation. We can find equivalents in many parts of the country to some classic examples of this kind of physical segregation-related barriers, like the Pompano Beach Wall in Florida, well known to urban scholars. In that case, a white neighborhood lobbied to have a wall built between themselves and a black neighborhood to the northeast, to cut off even casual contact between the two areas. Not even any gates in this wall, it was purely to keep the two neighborhoods apart. Neither of these neighborhoods really count as a gated community, of course, because for one thing the wall did not surround either group. It only ran along their one common border. And for another, since there were no gates, it would not have been a gated community even if the wall had extended further. Today there are holes in the wall, and people move back and forth between the neighborhoods, but it remains an example of using physical barriers to strengthen the sorting out of contemporary urban populations into separate neighborhoods segregated along various dimensions like class and ethnicity.
In reviewing the research of others before her, Veselinov recognizes that genuine gated communities can and often do contribute to segregation by both class and ethnicity. For example, she notes that research on the populations of such communities has found not only that gated communities are often segregated by race, but that gated communities with mostly black or Hispanic residents are less likely to be owner-occupied neighborhoods and more likely to be rental developments. In some ways, gated communities seem to look like little microcosms of the larger cities in which they appear, reflecting the existing patterns of segregation that also occur outside their walls. This brings us back to her main research question about possible links between that more general pattern of sorting out and segregation and the prevalence of gated communities. Do cities with higher levels of ordinary segregation by ethnicity and class also have more gated communities? Could we perhaps just count up the gated communities and get a good indicator for the amount of segregation found in the general population of a city? A possible link between conventional segregation and the extent of gated communities, Veselinov decides to look at the factors that predict each kind of sorting out pattern in urban populations. Her units of analysis for comparison are metropolitan areas all around the United States. For outcomes to be predicted, she chooses simply the percentage of the total population of a city counted as living in gated communities as one measure. Like so many other researchers, for her measure of conventional segregation patterns, she chooses our old friend, the Index of Dissimilarity. She calculates this index related to two segregation contrasts across the census tracts of each metro area. The index of dissimilarity between the distributions of black and white residents and the index of dissimilarity between Hispanic and white residents. Over all the cities she considers, the average percent of people living in gated communities was just under 8%. The d-index for black-white segregation was about 58% meaning that over half of either the black or the white people in these cities would have to move to different neighborhoods to get rid of the observed residential imbalance. The D-index average for Hispanic white segregation was 44%, slightly lower than the average for black white segregation, just as most other researchers usually find. Possibility for comparing these forms of segregation across cities would be to calculate a simple correlation between these three outcome measures. A correlation coefficient would indicate directly whether one of these measures tends to be higher or lower when the others are also higher or lower. But this direct comparison is not the way that Veselinov decides to go with her analysis. Instead, she looks at the other characteristics of urban areas that have been found in other research to predict each kind of segregation. What explains, for example, why some cities have higher levels of black-white segregation while other cities have lower levels? Previous studies have identified the usual suspects as possible causes, and she borrows many of these predictors from those other studies. For example, when a minority population makes up a higher share of the total population of a city, segregation between that minority and the majority white population often is found to be higher as well. The white majority may feel more threatened by a minority when it amounts to a third of the population than when it is only a tenth of the population. Scholars of segregation also consistently find that educated people are less likely to be segregated from each other by race, and econ economists sometimes suggest that residential segregation is higher where unemployment rates are also higher. One feature of cities that can't be measured by looking at the characteristics of individuals also have been linked to segregation. Cities with a lot of government jobs, such as state capitals and university towns, may have less segregation. Older cities may have more segregation than newer cities. There may even be regional subcultural segregation, so that we find different levels in the South, the West, or the Northeast, even after taking all the other factors into account. So Veselinov decides to create three different models predicting each kind of segregation in terms of these other features of various cities. Following her logic, if gated communities are just another way of describing a consistent pattern of sorting out in American cities, then the same predictive factors should show up as important in each model.
If percent black or percent college educated predicts black-white segregation, it should also predict the extent of gated communities. Her model predicting black-white d-index values, shown in the second column of her Table 3 in the article, replicates a lot of other research about black-white segregation. Compared to her reference group from the Midwest, represented here by the zero line in this figure, cities in the South and the West are significantly less segregated. We already know from other research that this may be deceptive for southern cities, since segregation there may often occur at a much smaller scale than is captured by census tracts as units of analysis. She also reports that cities with bigger income gaps between blacks and whites also have significantly higher levels of residential segregation. This is hardly surprising since income determines residential possibilities to such an important extent. She also finds small but significant effects of higher segregation where the black population is a bigger share of the total city, and lower segregation where the city is more educated on average. These are standard results, pretty much what we would expect. Her model predicting Hispanic white d-index values also comes up with some commonly reported patterns. For, ex for example, the share of the black population has nothing to do with Hispanic segregation, but the share of the Hispanic population does. She finds that the Northeast region, labeled simply North region in her table, including New York, New England, Pennsylvania, and so on, has significantly more residential segregation of Hispanics than does the Midwest reference group. But there are not significant differences between the Midwest, the South, or the West. Finally, she notices that for some reason Hispanic segregation from whites seems slightly lower in cities where there's a higher unemployment rate. This negative relationship between jobs and segregation makes no sense to her, but she reports it anyway. It's already interesting to note that these two models for predicting black versus Hispanic segregation from do not even identify the same predictors between themselves. But the acid test of her idea that gating is just ordinary segregation by another name comes in her model predicting percentages living in gated communities. The first column of her Table 3 produces results that are even further from both of the other two models. She only finds three factors that predict significant differences across cities in the percent of people living behind gates and walls. Cities that have a lot of government and university jobs have significantly lower shares of people behind gates. And in complete contrast to both patterns of conventional segregation, she finds that gated communities are significantly more common in the south and west regions of the country, both regions that were significantly less segregated for either of her d-index measures. So what is she to make of this very different set of predictors for gated communities? Veselinov basically gives up her original hypothesis that gating goes along with other forms of segregation, that they're basically parallel outcomes. She has no choice, because clearly they are not parallel outcomes. Instead, she speculates in the last pages of her article on the possibility that gated communities may instead be some kind of alternative to conventional segregation. It has been said of racial segregation that if you're black in the South, Whites don't care how close you get, just so you don't get too high up. This means that residential segregation is not as important as maintaining racial barriers to economic success. The same saying suggests that if you're black in the north, whites don't care how high up you get, just so you don't get too close. In other words, barriers to economic success are not important, but residential segregation is important. Perhaps gated communities offer yet another dimension for sorting out populations. If a city's neighborhoods are not otherwise highly sorted out by race, one way to achieve such separation might be to move into a gated community that does have the desired homogeneity inside its walls. This raises a couple of additional interesting possibilities about gated communities that take us back to even earlier ideas and writers. If Veselinov is right in saying that living behind these gates and walls is simply fear and anxiety, we might think back to Claude Fisher and his subcultural ideas and wonder whether a gated community could itself be considered a kind of subculture of fear. Do insecure people who are afraid of the rest of the city self-select into these neighborhoods?
On the other hand, if these neighborhoods do not actually reveal any higher sense of community when studied in that fashion, maybe they're not subcultures after all. But might we instead see higher levels of urban anomie within gated communities as a result of more intense and impersonal standardization of behavior like that prescribed in the rules of homeowners associations? Are gated communities some kind of shift back toward the walled-off quarters found in pre-industrial cities? It seems safe to say that we still have a lot to learn about this feature of contemporary urban society.